Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to VG Myths, the online internet video game TV show that has officially ripped off Nathaniel Bandy. After years of anticipation, Splatoon 3 has finally been released to the bloodthirsty masses, and for some reason, the entirety of the internet has decided I'm the only person in the world bad enough at video games to play it wrong. Which, I mean, Nathaniel Bandy, but I guess I'm a close second. In how many shots can you complete Splatoon 3? The rules will be very familiar. We're doing a segmented, low-score run of Splatoon 3's single-player campaign with the ultimate goal of 100% completion while firing as few shots as possible. Quote-unquote segmented means we can retry each individual level as many times as are necessary to lower our score. Each level attempt begins at the start pad and ends when you accomplish that level's goal. But there's a bit of a wrench in the works making things more complicated than back in Octo Expansion. Splatoon 3's campaign features two explorable hub areas. Progress in these hub areas can't be reset by simply leaving and coming back like you can with a normal level. For that reason, they're a special exception. You can't reset their score! In order to get a better score on the hub areas specifically, you must start from a fresh save file. I highly recommend doing it right the first time. As for what a shot even is in the first place, we're using basically the same rules as Octo Expansion, where each weapon type counts shots in whatever way I felt was most fitting. For example, machine guns increment the counter once per target hit, so holding the ZR button down while splatting two enemies counts as two shots. Most other weapons will increment the counter by one when their ink is dispensed, since they generally only ink either all at once or in a volley once per button press. Also, a clarification on machine guns that has never been relevant until now. If you're unfamiliar with how shooting in Splatoon works, ink doesn't always travel its full range. Some ink globs will fall prematurely, meaning it's nearly impossible to shoot something without also hitting the ground in between. Not to mention, with a machine gun, it's difficult to tell whether or not you stopped firing your gun with precisely the correct ink glob that took out your target, potentially causing you to ink surfaces behind them accidentally. If we counted collateral damage as a separate machine gun shot, things would start getting absurdly complicated and difficult to even put a number on. Instead, we only count surfaces as targets if 1. You fire your weapon without hitting any actual targets, or 2. Inking that surface helps you in some tangible way. I know it's a bit semantics-y, but I hope you understand this is the best rule set I could find that doesn't require studying every single square millimeter of footage frame by frame. Also, important note if you skip the Octo Expansion videos, there are no semantics with quote-unquote hero weapons this time, especially since the majority of weapons weapons in this campaign aren't hero weapons. Whether it's a main or a special or a context-sensitive vacuum cleaner, if something is both weaponish and uses the ZR button, then that function of the weapon will increment the counter. There are some more specific nitty-gritty details about some weapons, but we'll get there when we get there. We've done rules talk long enough. For now, let's get this run started. Before even reaching the campaign, we have to complete Splatoon 3's tutorial. There doesn't appear to be any way to skip this, and after a short walk, you'll be locked in place and forced to demonstrate you know how to shoot. I tried sitting back and drinking a latte a few minutes, but like Splatoon 2's tutorial before it, this tutorial refuses to let you go without staining your hands. This immediately adds two shots to the counter and cements the run's status as minimalist. With that done, rush to the end and you'll be transported into the title screen. Important note for ultra purists, it is technically required to press CR to get past the title screen. I personally don't consider the menus to be a weapon, but obviously that is only my very biased opinion, so if you insist, feel free to add one extra shot to the counter. Now we can finally drop into the crater and start the campaign proper. This is the first of the two hub areas, featuring only four levels and almost nothing to explore. We're immediately presented with a problem. Each level is entered through a locked kettle, which must be attacked to open the lock. The only sub-weapon available in the crater is our little buddy, Small Fry, who completely ignores the kettles. Since it's required to open and beat all four levels to exit the crater, the definitive best possible score is four shots. Crater Level 1. Throwing Small Fry lets us clear the way up to this first switch, which must be inked to continue. While Small Fry can't directly spread ink, hitting those puffer fish earlier filled up our splashdown special, which can hit the switch no problem. There's a second switch along the way, but provided you left the other two puffer fish untouched earlier, they'll refill your splashdown 
down all the way back up to full, letting you casually walk to the end with zero shots. Crater Level 2 After swimming along the conveniently pre-inked paths, you'll eventually be stopped at this wall, which must be scaled to reach the level exit. Splashdown could theoretically ink the wall, but this time there are no pufferfish around to spread ink for us. You can charge up a little by having small fry splat the Octarians nearby, but nowhere near enough to reach full charge. However, there is still a way we can spread ink, and if you'd been paying real close attention in all three prior games, you should already be able to figure out how. If you plop near the edge of friendly ink, that ink will very slightly spread along the same surface. The special gauge only cares that you're spreading ink, regardless of the method, so while slow, plopping is an entirely valid method of charging special. However, it is obviously an incredibly tedious one, so I highly recommend taking some extra steps to make the process as painless as possible. First, remap the swim button to whichever button on the controller you're most comfortable mashing. Over an extended period of time, this strat is literally painful. Second is learning proper technique. Tilt the analog stick only slightly so your character is barely crawling forward, and tap the swim button at a relatively quick rhythm. Don't do it too fast or you won't plop properly. With just the right angle and rhythm, you'll be spreading ink at a lightning-fast snail's pace. Third, and most important, make the most of your time by drawing pretty pictures. Squids are a good first step, but if you're feeling particularly daring, go for a smiley face. Once proving yourself the face-painting champion, your splashdown will become available. Be sure to hug the wall directly, otherwise it won't actually ink and you'll be forced to repeat kindergarten. With the wall inked properly, you'll reach the goal in zero shots. Crater Level 3 We are immediately presented with a very simple roadblock. The ink rail forward is locked in a box, which can only be opened with a key down a very small ledge. The ledge is too high to jump up from ground level, normally requiring you to ink it. That's no problem though, you can jump up on the fencing near the key for enough of a height boost. From there, you can make a somewhat tight swimming jump through the upper fence and back above the ledge. I should also know I was informed of an alternate strat after the fact. With a very precise size small fry throw, he'll somehow hit the ink line and let you proceed without need for the key. We can grab the rest of the level's keys without issue, but in order to reach the boxes they go to, we need to ink this wall switch. There doesn't appear to be any friendly ink around, which would seemingly mean we can't use plop strats, but look closer. The checkpoint pad is legally swimmable ink, and contrary to expectation, you can actually plop at its edge to spread it onto the adjacent ground. Spend half an hour painting pretty pictures to charge up special and finally ink the switch. Even if it doesn't ink all the way immediately, remember you can still plop in the ink to spread it. Final score, zero shots. Crater Level 4 Despite being the last level, this one is the simplest with absolutely no roadblocks whatsoever. Zero shots. With all four crater levels beaten, the final hair glob will appear. Throwing small fry at this glob triggers the tutorial boss, DJ Octavio. Things immediately look bleak, so I'm gonna come right out and tell you you're not beating Octavio without firing your gun. In order to progress, you must splat either of Octobot's fists four times total, at which point Octavio himself will be launched out of Octobot. Once he's splatted, you move to the next phase and must repeat the process until Octavio has been splatted three times. Splatting the fists is simply not happening with Small Fry. The fists require a significant amount of ink before they're splatted, far more than Small Fry is capable of dealing before their vulnerability period ends. We also can't charge up our special through plopping since there's no friendly ink on the ground when the fight begins. You might think you could cleverly break your armor to spread some ink from the blast, but alas, that feature from prior games has since been removed. With our options exhausted, we take our first shot. Not to ink the fists, but to ink the ground. With one barrage, you can cover it enough to charge your special all the way. Hit a fist with Splashdown and enjoy that sinking realization that you're going to be spending the rest of your day headbutting the floor. Each charge will take even longer than usual, since Octavio will be constantly attacking and forcing you to dodge out of the way. Nevertheless, this is sustainable until Octavio is launched into the arena for the first time. Small Fry is capable of splatting him, but don't be so hasty, you're under absolutely no time limit, meaning you can preempt plop up special while Octavio watches in patient disbelief. With special charge, send small fry to splat Octavio and enter phase two. 
Octavio clears the arena of all ink, but since we already charged up special, you can get a twofer by splatting a fist and inking the ground with one splashdown. Octavio will start using the Octobot's vacuum, and the game will very strongly hint that it's totally a good idea to throw small fry at it, but absolutely do not throw small fry at it. All the vacuum does is negate your airborne ink within the air gusts. Clogging it is absolutely optional. Just keep charging up and expending splashdowns and carry your charge between phases two and three, and after roughly six hours of concussions, you'll defeat DJ Octavio with a final score of one shot. With that, we leave the crater and enter the game's second hub, Alterna, where we'll be spending the rest of the game. The devs have ever so sneakily designed the starting area such that the only accessible landmark is the kettle to enter the very first level, in which you'd earn enough power eggs to clear away a hair glob and start exploration proper. You might be tempted to accept inevitability and fire a shot to open the kettle, but hold your seahorses. Floating in a circle along the edge of Site 1 is an orange balloon containing 100 power eggs. This balloon will respawn when the player exits and re-enters Alterna, so theoretically, if this balloon balloon floats within range, we can farm it. The devs did their best to make the balloon frustratingly float just slightly too far to hit, but they didn't try hard enough. Notice we have access to a normally useless binocular platform. Binocular platforms are technically friendly inked surfaces just like checkpoints, and you can plop at their edges to spread ink on the ground just the same. Spread this ink all over the nearby corner, bide your time, and when the balloon is coming within range, do a swimming jumping throw. Swimming in ink gives extra momentum, increasing small fry's distance just enough to hit the balloon. That gives 100 power eggs, but unfortunately we need 600 total to clear the hair glob, so you'll need to land this super precise throw six total times. To make things go by just a little bit faster, spend your time while waiting for the balloon to ink a path backward. If you miss the balloon, immediately die a painful death. The balloon's position resets upon respawn, and that ink trail will let you get back to the corner quickly. There will still be a lengthy waiting period, but don't worry, I've actually got one more special trick up my sleeve capable of speeding up time. By the time you figure out what was wrong with that, it won't matter anymore. With six well-timed throws, you'll have 600 power eggs and can finally clear away that first hair glob without firing a shot. That's not the end of the grind, though. We're still not capable of entering any levels, and there are tons of hair globs blocking the path forward that require even more power eggs to clear. But from now, grinding for power eggs will at least be much faster. As for why we're even grinding in the first place, each side in the hub is home to three sardinium, which can be used to unlock upgrades in the Hero Gears upgrade tree. Among those upgrades are Splat Bombs, Burst Bombs, and Curling Bombs. Your first instinct will be Splat Bombs since they're the closest to the beginning of the upgrade tree, but they unfortunately aren't much help. The devs decided to make Kettles explosion proof this time around, so even with Splat Bombs we still can't enter any levels. Instead, make the even longer grind to unlock Curling Bombs. Curling Bombs deal melee damage on contact, and that melee damage is fully capable of damage kettles, thus finally granting us a method to enter a friggin' level. Obviously I started entering and clearing levels at this point since they're way better for farming power eggs, so I'll just jump ahead a bit and let you know you can 100% complete the Alterna hub area while firing zero shots. However, that doesn't mean your hero gear will be fully upgraded yet. There are still nine more Sardinium inaccessible to us, locked behind three boss fights. Level 9999, Big Man, and and level 9999, Shiver. Both of these two are relatively easy to beat in zero shots thanks to both curling bombs and burst bombs, both of which you can unlock in advance. Neither Master Mega nor Big Fry's swim form seem to have regenerating health, so as long as you don't flub yourself to death, you'll eventually win automatically. Slightly harder will be level 9999, Fry. 
In order to make Fry herself vulnerable, you must splat each of the masked eels that appear during Fry's attacks. While there does seem to be carryover of how many eels you've splatted between attacks, they will eventually respawn, meaning if you can't splat them all on the quick, you'll never be able to advance the battle. Whether or not you'll have enough time is largely dependent on which attacks Fry uses. The absolute best attack is Eel Vision, during which the eels will be very close together, allowing for easy damage from explosives. You could also theoretically hit a ton of them with splat down, but there's a bit of a caveat. Fry only becomes vulnerable for a limited amount of time, so I recommend having Splashdown charged specifically to deal damage to her. Even so, don't be afraid to use a Splashdown on a giant group of eels if the opportunity presents itself. If you play your cards right, you might be able to recharge Splashdown before taking out the final eel. This will be a long endurance battle, but with a lot of patience and a bit of luck, you can beat Fry in zero shots. Now that you have all the sardines, the entire upgrade tree is open. I recommend buying almost all of it, with the caveat that you should skip both sensor upgrades. These are actually downgrades in disguise, permanently cluttering your screen with annoying squares and an insufferable beeping noise. Otherwise, I highly recommend prioritizing the final upgrade on the tree early. The small fry damage increase makes him the most powerful weapon in the game, one-shotting most enemies while using almost no ink. With the upgrade tree finished, let's finally get to the part of the game this video is ostensibly about. Level 0101 as you'd expect being the first level, this is one of the easiest in the game, especially since we're allowed to bring in all our upgrades. But what if hypothetically you didn't know about the balloon and came into this level without upgrades? Early on in routing this run, I did the level that way, and screw it, I want to show it off. When trying to get one of the keys, there's a rolly wall across the way you're intended to hit with the Trizuka special. Instead, do a running hop off the ledge, throw small fry, then reverse direction to land back on solid ground. With just right timing, Small Fry will extend the bridge towards you. For the last key, since we don't have bombs in this hypothetical, you'll need to plop up a splashdown to get up this first wall. Up above, you might be worried you'll have to plop another splashdown, but no worries. You can mess with the squeegee's positioning by throwing Small Fry at it. Get it to make a low enough arc and you can jump onto it from the nearby fence, then ride it to the top, no ink required. Even without upgrades, you can reach the goal in zero shots. Level 0102 this level gives us a choice of three loadouts to use. Remember, if you use anything other than the Hero Gear loadout, none of your purchased upgrades apply. Of course, if you can choose Hero Gear, that's almost always the correct choice, since that means you'll have access to all your sub-weapons in addition to all the passive buffs. This level in particular is an incredibly simple straight line to the goal, so with burst bombs you can easily clear it in zero shots. In addition, to save on time, I'll just quickly let you know that most levels in this game, seen on screen now, can be cleared shotless trivially. This includes levels with simple goals that allow subweapons, levels built primarily around subweapon usage, and levels where you literally don't have a gun in the first place. Don't worry, you're not missing much. Level 0108. So I'm checking my notes and not even looking at the footage while I write this script, and uh, this is the one that they just copy-pasted from Octo Expansion. So, uh, I'm doing the same. History's greatest squid researchers will be debating this for years, but the best conclusion with our primitive modern day technology is that this station requires one shot. Level 0109. While we don't have burst bombs, we are given curling bombs, which still allow for just enough inking and splatting potential. Near the end, you'll have to do a very annoying upward curling bomb throw to take out four shielded Octarians. Try to throw the curling bomb at the wall behind them in the hopes it stays bouncing up on the platform. With patience, you'll either take out the shield or get a lucky throw that splats an Octarian early. Final total? Zero shots. Level 0204. Seeing an on-rail shooter level might be giving you Octo Expansion flashbacks, but don't worry, this is far easier than any ink rail segment seen in that game. Burst bombs are accurate and strong enough to clear out all boxes easily in the first two checkpoints. The only stickler is the final set of boxes, including a very durable orange box. Rather than just spamming burst bombs, do a few jumps backwards to stall for time and you'll have more than enough ink to take out the orange box and clear the stage in zero shots. Level 0205. I mentioned this level level only in case you hadn't realized the crab tank features a cannon as its subweapon, which does not increment the counter, clearing the level in zero shots. Level 0207. This is a limited ink challenge with no subweapons, which I'm sure you realize means shots are absolutely required. 
First, we'll need one shot on the ink wheels at the level's beginning, serving the dual purpose of inking the wall up and triggering the geyser. Next, we'll enter a puzzle room full of switches and ink wheels. Normally, you'd expend another shot on the one ink wheel that clears the room in a chain reaction, but hold on a second. Remember our old plopping strats? Turns out, even though these switches are elevated a bit, you can still spread ink onto them by plopping the adjacent ground. If you've got a few minutes on hand, you can plop this entire room, thus shaving a shot. The next section has no such shenanigans available, requiring our second shot to extend the ink line. There's an upcoming sniper with a wall of boxes seemingly blocking the path, which you can very simply hop around. I'm pretty sure it's dev intended. You'll still have to fire a shot to open the goal, thus giving a final score of three shots. Level 0208. This one is a huge doozy that on multiple separate occasions I thought I was done with before new discoveries and strats dragged me screaming back. To ease us in and get an idea of how the level is actually structured, let's finish the level normally. We're trying to hit nine switches scattered around a maze. Once a switch is hit, the block it's attached to will travel out of the maze and into its assigned space to create a tower toward the goal, with all nine switches required before the tower is complete and the bridge toward it will extend. Before even entering the maze, you need to ink the first switch across a gap. While a grounded bomb at the far edge is capable of hitting the switch, the angle makes it difficult, and I've found it's more consistent to aim for the wall above. Important note, bombs seem to be explicitly programmed to never count down their timer while in midair, so if you are hoping for a midair detonation, that isn't an option. Switch number two and switch number three can be inked with grounded bombs, no problem. Switch number four is too far above for bombs to reach, requiring one shot. Switch number five is unforgiving. You can ink it by lobbing a bomb on top of the boxes, but obviously that means the boxes will break in the process, giving you only one attempt per life. Switch number six is too high, requiring shot number two. Switch number seven is close to the ground, but switch number eight Eight is on the ceiling behind it. I've tried both throwing bombs directly under and splatting a nearby Octarian directly under, but both have been unsuccessful, always only inking a very specific straight line on one of the switch's edges. I assume this is some kind of programming quirk, and I'm doubtful it's actually possible to ink the switch with bombs, so here we make shot number three. Finally, switch number nine is very simply too high up to hit, requiring shot number four. This completes the tower and allows us to finish the level. That means four shots to beat the level like God intended. But what if we're feeling a little bit demonic? Remember, the blocks travel from the maze and move into the tower. They try to exit the maze in ways that would throw the player off, but with some clever movement, you can hitch a ride. This is even a dev intended trick, albeit one that is supposed to be fruitless. But hold on one second. Since each block moves to its assigned point in the maze, if we preemptively trigger all blocks above the one we hitch a ride on, all blocks below become optional, and we can climb the incomplete tower up to the goal. In a minimum shot attempt, any uninked walls above the block we ride would require one shot each. And just a reminder, plopping won't work here, since plopped ink refuses to travel between separate blocks. To make this strat viable, we'll have to hitch a ride on as high a block as we can, while simultaneously ink as many of the same side of the blocks above it as we can. The topmost block is the very first scene in the level, before entering the maze. Riding it is out of the question, but theoretically we can get some ink on either its left or right side by throwing a bomb to that side as it's rising out of the maze, just before it takes off. We don't normally have enough time to recharge ink for a second bomb throw after inking the switch, though. But pay close attention when you ink the switch. The bridge that raises is inkable ground, and and before hitting the switch, it's oriented as a wall below us. With a very precise and lucky splat bomb throw, a random ink splotch can hit and ink this wall, allowing us to dip in and paint a generous pool with plops. Now that we've got an ink well, get back to trying to ink the switch, always dropping down to recharge ink between throws. If you min-max your time properly, you'll be able to ink whichever of the sidewalls you're aiming for. Keep in mind, you want your ink to land as high on the block as possible, because it turns upside down on its trip to the tower. Block number two and three are the upper and lower stacked blocks, respectively. As established previously, we'll always need one shot to switch block number two. As for inking its sides, it seems too high for that to be possible, but let's put a pin in that for later. Block number three, we're fully capable of hitching a ride on. This is a dandy skip and all, but once we arrive, you'll notice a problem. We didn't ink block number two switch for obvious reasons. You might think that makes block number three a non-viable ride, but we've got a another trick.
trick up our sleeves. Ink up both the switch side of the block as well as the side to the switch's right. Now for the outer wall. While bombs can't detonate in midair, they can detonate at the last second while falling off a ledge while still technically legally grounded. With luck, the bomb will be at the proper angle to ink the outer wall. Now you can very slowly and carefully plop into the ink on the wall to spread it up to the block. With all preparation done, you can go for the main event. Normally, if you'd inked block number one properly at the beginning of the level, you'd be done now and could very easily squid surge up. Alas, on this attempt, my ink splotches were too far to reach with a squid surge. Very, very astronomically luckily though, after about five hopeless minutes throwing my controller out of every window I could find, I figured out yet another trick. If you very quickly exit and re-enter swim form at the peak of a squid surge, you'll be allowed to enter ink higher than usual, saving this run and allowing us to finish 0208 in one singular shot. This level alone delayed this video by multiple days and is by far the hardest level in the entire Splatoon 3 minimum gun run. Yes, even that one. I'm happy. Let's move on. Level 0302. This level's incredibly easy in zero shots. I just wanted to note you don't actually have to dodge the missiles. You can just sit between them and sip a latte. Level 0305. Going shotless here is absolutely absolutely definitively impossible, since we don't have sub-weapons. Of the three available weapons, the flings a roller is the easy, obvious choice. Roller shots are incremented when they fling ink, but you can keep that one shot going by keeping the ZR button held down and transition into melee mode. You can even jump while in melee mode to hit upper targets, but that isn't quite enough to clear this stage in one shot. Eventually, you'll need to stop and refill ink. Even if you keep the button held down, entering swim mode exits melee mode automatically firing another shot when you stop swimming. That means refilling ink functionally requires a shot. Don't give up hope though, we just need to min-max our ink a bit better. Instead of walking to your destination, go bunny mode. Ink is not expended if the roller isn't touching the ground. Hop between every set of boxes and your ink will last just long enough to break every box, completing the stage in one shot. Level 0306. You might be happy seeing burst bombs, but sorry, Sorry, this is without a doubt one of the hardest levels in the entire game. We have exactly one minute to destroy 60 balloons, meaning we need to hit roughly one per second. Burst bombs simply don't recharge fast enough, even when factoring in multi-kills. Taking shots is inevitable, and exactly how many shots is a huge question mark. What isn't a question is weapon choice. You should absolutely use the H3 nozzle nose. It fires in bursts, meaning a single shot can hit up to three balloons. Most later balloons are clumped together, so we'll be taking our shots early. The the following footage is my personal best. <laughs> Best score? 
four shocks. Though I will note, I absolutely expect three or less to be possible, but I've decided I don't hate myself enough right now. By the way, random fun fact, back in Octo Expansion, if you hit the mission complete trigger after the timer ran out, you'd still get credit for beating the level. In Splatoon 3, basketball rules no longer apply. If the timer hits zero, you're a dead corpse, whether your dead corpse passes the finish line or not. Level 0404. Our only sub-weapon capable option here is a preset loadout with small fry, meaning we won't be bringing in any of our upgrades. While not particularly difficult, this level is fun sub-weapon only since you'll end up in some tight spots without much room to move around while small fry very slowly whittles down enemy health. This includes an encounter with a sniper at the end who will inevitably clear the ink from your soaker block and leave you at small fry's mercy. Otherwise, an easy zero shot. Level 0405. This level is one of the big ones I was dreading, the return of the adorable sculpting minigame. If you're not familiar, we have to destroy some of the boxes on one side of the level to match those seen on the other. Unlike the Octo Expansion equivalents, we now have a huge convenience of the Zipcaster, allowing for totally shot-free box clearing. The really dreadful part, though, is the Zipcaster deals splash damage near its point of impact. On top of that, the splash damage radius increases on box break, guaranteeing that you'll be dealing at least some damage to boxes that fail the mission once broken. The hardest section to clear will be the backside, where you'll need to leave three one-box spaces in between intact boxes, a very stressfully specific order. Remember, though, the splash damage radius increases when a box is broken, and conversely, is lower when a box does not break. Butter up the boxes you need to break in advance while the splash damage is low range, so when a box breaking splash inevitably occurs, it will break the boxes you want it to while leaving the others technically intact. Once the backside is done, the rest will be a victory lap. Despite the stress, I was able to clear this level in zero shots my first try. I'm sorry, Vandy. Level 0406. This target practice level seems like it'll be easy enough at first. The yellow boxes can be destroyed with one burst bomb and give you more than enough time to recharge. There's one holdout, though, a single orange box halfway through. This box just barely aggravatingly seems impossible to damage enough by the time the box enters our range. But here's the thing. Why wait for it to enter our range? While the early boxes are spawning in, min-max your time to ink the side of the stage, near the fence. When the box prior to the orange one is getting prepped, swim over and up the side of the arena, take care of the box, and quickly swim jump onto the fence itself. This effectively increases our range to include the box's spawn location, getting in a few early burst bombs just enough to close the damage gap. Final score, zero shots. Level 0407. With only a goo tuber and no sub weapons, this level absolutely requires shots, and those shots will need to be carefully considered to get the count as low as possible. You can dodge most enemies at the beginning, save for two snipers. The walls they sit on will only open after they've been splatted, and the edges around the wall extend too far to jump around. That means we start with two shots by default. Then we reach the final area, a fortress with multiple waves of enemies, every single one of which needing to be splatted to proceed. This section is impossible without climbing up the fortress at least partially, and there's no way up without either activating one of the ink lines or inking walls ourselves. Ever conveniently, this splatling Octarian is at a very inconvenient place for multi-kills while also being directly in line with two climbable walls. Do a backward squid roll at the top of the upper wall and you can reach the grating on the opposite side. Here, take out both snipers with one shot, then all three shielded enemies with another. The next set of enemies can be done in a very simple and obvious two shots. After is the final two enemies, a single sniper and a barrier producing Octo Disco hanging out above. The Octo Disco has so much HP it requires two shots to splat, so you might think this requires at least three shots, but there's still shave potential. Sit at just the right spot and aim up at just the right angle. Eventually, the Octo Disco will get bored and dissipate the barrier for absolutely no reason. Take one more shot to finish off the Octo Disco, then another to open the goal. Final score, 10 shots. Level 0408. Being a grind rail target mission, this one seems like it'll be hell, but no worries. This is likely the easiest grinding level seen in the series, giving almost no targets and plenty of time to pop them. The one slightly tricky part is at the end, where you might need to slow down slightly but even then not very much. Score, zero shots. Level 0410. 
Another target shooting mission, but this time you stand in place and each set of balloons moves around in front of you. They float away after their pattern completes and you automatically die if a fail balloon gets popped. While fail balloons pop instantly from a direct burst bomb hit, they can always survive a single splash damage hit regardless of distance, giving you a bit of leeway. The first three sets are relatively easy. The fourth set I genuinely believe to be absolutely, literally, no way, no how impossible. It's impossible to pop most of the target balloons without dealing splash damage to at least one fail balloon, inevitably leading to an overlap that causes failure. But I have good news. Failure is an entirely valid option. After headbutting my controller for about half an hour, the game took pity on me and opened the way forward despite not having popped all the targets yet. I have absolutely no idea why this happens, but presumably it has something to do with targets that take splash damage getting recognized as hit, even though they're totally not supposed to and most of the time don't. An interesting consequence of this glitch is that the two balloons left over will still be in play every time you respawn at the next checkpoint and if you don't pop them within 10 seconds, the game will change its mind on the freebie and splat you. That's only a mild inconvenience, so go ahead and get to attempting the final set of balloons, which is difficult to figure out, but certainly not impossible. Our final score? Zero shots. Level 0412. This level is a simple connect-the-dots drawing minigame with only a choice of two brushes and no sub-weapons. This naturally means we use one shot to ink some switches near the beginning, one to actually connect the dots, followed by one to ink and open the goal for an end total of three shots. I will note I did briefly look into plopping ink from the very first checkpoint to shave off the first shot, but there's an uninkable surface in the way crossing that strat off the list. Level 0507. Golly gee, you hear a Splatoon dev in the distance? Wouldn't it be sadistic to those YouTuber challenge weirdos if we made a grind rail level with splat bombs instead of burst bombs? Yes, in fact, it would, and wouldn't you know it, Splatoon's devs are proud sadists. Shotless is explicitly impossible, and you'll need ludicrously perfect aim to get the count as low as you can. Toss a bomb in the center of the first ring, get on the rail, and prepare for hell. These first two boxes can both be hit with well-timed throws directly at their front, where the bomb will hopefully stop in place. Remember to stall to recharge ink along the way. There are two large boxes coming up, both of which are relatively easy to land a bomb on. Next, a group of four boxes. Landing a bomb on them doesn't seem viable since even when I did land one, it didn't destroy all four, so here we take shot number one. Next, several more sets of boxes on separate platforms. These platforms make bomb throws very forgiving. Just aim for the center and the bomb will rest inside. Next, two very cool feeling throws in the center of these sets. The following set of six I've tried bombs on, and that even looks like it should theoretically be feasible, but in practice it didn't work out. If a bomb exploded at all, it wouldn't hit every box, and I kept encountering a glitch where the bomb would apparently think it's in midair and just sit there endlessly. That means we take shot number two. The upcoming stack of boxes can be taken out easy with two bomb throws. Hello, good morning, it's Unscripted Game Champ. So this video is like 90% done. Like I already did almost everything. And okay, so the next set of boxes, like you can just, you can throw a bomb into the center. It's really annoying, but you can do it. But notice on my, on the, t the successful attempt, I threw a bomb and missed. And then I threw a second one in the center. But the first bomb, the first bomb, it didn't, fully actually miss. It ended up in like the infinite not exploding glitch thing, but then it exploded like immediately simultaneously with the second bomb. And that's why I just, I just didn't even notice until now. <laughs> The diagonal orientation of the next couple sets prevents bombs from resting on them long enough to explode, so we use one shot to clear out both. The next linear set of diagonal boxes has the same problem, requiring one more shot. Now we circle around an orange box with a small yellow box on top. By stalling, there's more than enough time to blow them both up. I have absolutely zero hope of bombing all the final boxes at all, let alone in the extremely tight time window. So there we make shot number five, finishing the level in five total shots. I'm reasonably confident this is the true minimum, barring some ludicrous extreme Tash shenanigans, but please let me know if you manage to shave one off. Level 0510. 
Yet another grind rail level, but thankfully this time we actually have burst bombs, and on top of that, it's incredibly easy. We have more than enough time to hit every switch along the way to the final tower, and once you reach said tower, you've practically already won. All switches can be hit with jumping throws, and you'll be safely dropped below even if you miss one. Score, zero shots. Level 0512. We are immediately presented with a mid-air switch that must be inked, but if you've been paying attention, you'll realize we already have a strat. Get down below and throw up bombs, aiming for the bomb to explode at the absolute last possible moment before it's technically no longer grounded. The switch is close enough that it will get inked by the explosion. A bit later in the level is this room, with three Octarians on the ceiling all too far to hit with bombs. I've toyed a little with exploding a bomb on the bag in the center of the room, but that's obviously still going to be too far away, so instead we take one shot with the ballpoint splatling to splat all three. The rest of the level can be traversed mostly easily with bombs, but one note when you reach this point. Do not immediately splat the switch. If you do, then the wall that raises will be unclimbable, since it's split between two blocks. Beforehand, hop up to this ledge and throw down bombs. With a precise splotch, you'll be able to ink the wall before it's raised. From there, ink the switch as usual, plop up the wall, and walk to the goal with a final score of one shot. Level 0604. This minimum ink challenge was actually already designed for the minimum shot run by the devs on purpose, so you can very easily walk past every hazard and open the goal with one shot. Level 0607. This level is under a soft time limit, with the level gradually falling into the water below segment by segment. Don't panic though, it's not as scary as it sounds. Each section will only begin falling when you set foot on its floor. Setting tentacles on its walls is completely safe, so before jumping up, sit on the wall for a second to recharge your ink, ensuring you always have enough for a burst bomb when you need one. Score, zero shots. Level 0610. This level forces us into a permanent inkjet special. That means our only shotless method of attack is the jets fired directly below us. At this gap with ink sticks, you can get through with careful timing. Position yourself just to the side of the ink stick, wait for the ink furler to bounce back, and follow it. At this long fall, you're intended to fire at the ink furler across the way, but by exiting a swim just before dashing forward, you'll get a bit of extra height letting you close the distance shotless. Next is a wave of flying Octarians, all of whom must be splatted to proceed. They very much do not enjoy being inked and will fly out of your range quickly, so you'll need a bit of cheese to make this possible. Lure them low to the ground and adjacent to the tall pillar, and sneak around the opposite side. Once they exit alert mode, hop to the top of the pillar and rush them. This likely won't deal enough damage in one go, and they've got regenerating health, so set them back up and repeat the strat immediately immediately. If done well, you'll hit them again before they can fully recover, eventually stacking enough for a splat. Repeat with every member of the group, and the next wave will spawn in, four hopping Octarians. These guys are much worse at their jobs. If you very quickly exit and re-enter your ink, you can gradually approach. Every time, the Octarians will see you, jump back, and promptly forget you exist. Corral them near the end of the stage, and while they're theoretically trying not to bounce off, eventually they'll mess up and fall to their deaths. Repeat four times to continue to the final checkpoint. Bad news, this section is pretty simply impossible. With a gigantic gap, we have no way of traversing. Fire one shot at the pufferfish, then avoid the judging eyes of small fry as you slink pathetically to the goal. Level 0611. This one is easy, but I include it anyway because it was still fun. Go with the burst bomb loadout. In addition to old-fashioned stealth, you can also exploit the very stupid AI. This is best seen on the two at the end. Position yourself just right, and you can get them stuck in a pattern, constantly wiggling back and forth while getting nothing of substance done and eventually succumbing to your burst bombs. Final score, zero shots. Level 0612. The melee attack of the Ultra Stamp is activated with ZR and is thus off limits. We can still throw it, however, and by choosing the Ultra Stamp loadout, we'll have infinite ammo. Not only can throws clear the level, I actually had an easier time than in my cast casual playthrough. Throws are apparently the faster option. Score, zero shots. That marks the end of every main level. Next stop, 
Endgame. We unfortunately won't be having much buildup at all since these levels are all exceptionally easy due to the allowance of the hero gear. One important note is that we're counting the finale as six separate stages based on information given by the game. In addition to the obvious loading screen labels for the first four stages, if you attempt to return to camp, the game explicitly says that you're allowed to skip any stages you've previously cleared. The skip button just so happens to align its skips with the loading screen labels, with only the two final levels being unlabeled. Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the final boss fight against Mr. Grizz. Phase 1, as all prior levels, is incredibly easy shotless, but Phase 2 is where things get tricky, tasking us with piloting the Octobot King to vacuum hair globs off Mr. Grizz. If you think we're gonna pull out some semantics and say the vacuum actually gives us negative shots, I appreciate the enthusiasm, but hell no. We're fully committing to sucking as little as possible. I define a shot with the vacuum as one unique session of vacuuming. Once you either let go of ZR or get ejected from the cockpit, that shot ends and further use of the vacuum increments the counter once again. There are four hair globs we need to hit, and to make our jobs as hard as possible, waves of enemies will appear while vacuuming globs 1, 3, and 4. If you get hit by an enemy, you'll instantly be ejected from the cockpit. There's a trick to min-max this, though. Each wave of enemies waits until you begin vacuuming before they spawn. When they do spawn, they'll be in an ink form and must travel from the hair glob to the Octobot King before they actually properly appear. Get as close to the glob as possible, start vacuuming, and immediately reverse direction, stopping as you near the edge of the vacuum's range. This allows you to take out glob 1 in a single shot. There's still a problem though, which I'm sure most of you have already been screaming. When the glob explodes, we're ejected from the cockpit instantly, with no warning. As you have probably already noticed, that does not cause the ZR button to stop being held down. We have to do that manually, meaning if we don't let go of ZR with astronomically pixel-perfect reaction time, we'll inevitably be taking an extra shot with the hero shot once per glob. That is, unless we use a very particular and obscure piece of knowledge I never imagined would ever be important. Have you ever wondered what happens if you press both the R button and ZR button at the same time? Try it right now and comment below what happens. About half of you are gonna comment the R button took priority and about half are gonna say that ZR took priority. But don't worry, nobody's a filthy liar. Turns out the game doesn't directly prioritize either of the two buttons. Instead, the game will prioritize whichever of the two buttons was most recently pressed. If you press and hold ZR, then press and hold R, you'll aim your sub-weapon. But if you press and hold R, then press and hold ZR, you'll shoot your gun. See where this is going? These rules apply even while piloting the Octobot King, with one crucial difference. Without a sub-weapon, even if we press R, the vacuum won't be interrupted. But even so, the R button was still technically pressed after the ZR button. Thus, once you're ejected from the cockpit, the R button takes priority. Let go of ZR before letting go of R, and you're golden. Four seemingly impossible to dodge shots successfully dodged. One important but currently inconsequential note, it's entirely possible to vacuum later globs than you're supposed to be targeting. However, as far as I could tell, doing this is completely pointless. I spent a ton of time vacuuming a later glob and it refused to ever burst. Plus, upon reaching the point where I was supposed to target that glob, it appeared to still be at full health. As mentioned previously, glob number one requires one shot. Glob number two doesn't spawn any enemies, making it easy to take out with one shot. Glob number three has more health than the prior two, so I'm pretty sure doing it in just one shot is impossible. However, if you min-max, you can totally skip the second wave of enemies and take it out in two shots. Glob number four will be tackled in much the same way. I hope that doing it in two shots might also be possible, but I've never managed it and have only done it in three, even with min-maxing. With all globs gone, if you've still got time, the rest is a victory lap. Fire one very big and very final shot to end Mr. Grizz's ambition once and for all.
With the physical manifestation of capitalism obliterated and the path opened for the next manifestation in the form of DLC, the Splatoon 3 Minimum Gun Run ends with the final score of 46 shots. But final is in quotation marks. Remember, we're out to complete the game, and there just so happens to be a tiny asterisk in the postgame. Welcome to the true finale, level 0000 after Alterna. The good news is you've got the hero gear, so while theoretically this is the hardest level in the game, in a minimum shot run, almost all of it is about the same difficulty as a casual run. The bad news is, I just said almost. Before heading in, I recommend finally buying both sensor upgrades. They'll actually genuinely have at least one practical purpose in this level, so they're worth the annoyance. Near the end of the first load zone, you'll need to jump through a very quick set of moving platforms. Luckily, these are the same platforms rotating around over and over. Over, and any ink from burst bombs thrown down will stay there. Spend a few minutes throwing bombs down until the path is pre-inked, giving you a simple and easy path to jump across. Load Zone 2 is where the suffering starts. Once again, a grind rail target shooting mission. This time, we've got all our hero gear upgrades, including access to both burst bombs and max damage small fry. Nevertheless, this is still going to be the hardest grind rail mission in the game, forcing us to play a very careful balance of throwing burst bombs for speed and throwing small fry to keep progress going while our ink recharges. All the while, you'll need to be constantly hopping off the rail to stall yourself, otherwise you don't have a hope of popping every balloon in time. And even that won't be so simple. In order to recharge our ink efficiently, we need to legally be in submerged ink recharge time when we jump. If you jump out of ink, you'll momentarily keep the submerged ink recharge charge rate. However, you can't recharge ink at all while the ink used from a sub-weapon is in the process of subtracting. After throwing out a burst bomb, wait out your jump just slightly to get that extra recharge. Otherwise, you'll need to carefully aim your shots, in particular trying to pop multiple balloons with each burst bomb whenever possible. It's not totally necessary all the time, but it helps. After multiple downward spirals, you'll reach a set of three side-by-side -side rails. Hitting every balloon in time would normally not be that much harder than usual, but the directional window for hopping between rails is very forgiving in a bad way. I would constantly lose runs hopping between them for no reason. I recommend trying to stay on one of the edge rails as long as possible. Every balloon is still within range, and having no rail on one side makes accidental rail hopping easier to avoid. With that set done, you'll move on to what is thankfully the easiest section, an upward climb surrounding groups of balloons which spawn up to three at a time. A burst bomb aim near the center will combo all three. If you miss one, don't panic. With some precise movement, you can hop off the rail and land back on it a floor below. Next up are another couple free groups until a free fall with the final set. You might be tempted to panic, and yes, please panic, that is indeed the correct strategy. If you're lucky, your burst bombs will hit every balloon just in time, spawning the final rail to save you from a watery death and let you shift back into easy mode. Load Zone 3 is a totally simple octo-missile auto-scroller, and Load Zone 4 is a simple and very lightly challenging battle against an army of octolings. This is why I suggested grabbing the sensor upgrades. Seeing the octolings around corners gives you a very slight edge. It isn't totally necessary though, keep your distance and you can leisurely splat them with small fry one by one. With the final final level conquered, we increase our true final score by zero. Before heading out, special thanks to basically every Splatoon fan on the planet who helped shave the shot count down by sending in their home-baked strats. This episode was, once again, a collaborative effort and wouldn't have been possible without you. And just a reminder, the final total is always in quotation marks. And finally, special thanks to all Patreon backers, including Anon42, Lively Leader, Alex Nelson, Jace Nilges is out $10 just because he likes it when Miss Champ reads his name. Random Goy, never mind, I can't come up with something better. Game Champ says trans rights are human rights. Hashtag EMT and specialist Sander Kozak, Crustacean Creep, Evil Game Champ is like Bad Evening Nobody, and Unwelcome Forward to WH Facts, the offline on paper board game movie. Nathaniel Kalita, Jor, Britface says, You think changing the vocal tier can stop my love and support? Uh. Arkham, Soulless Game of Chess Black, and 
and XF6. Join the Discord to check the board state. I have pictures. Now I only want to triumph. I be Mackie, 8-Bit Mistrevious, Mackie B, Eve Cable, Attempted Wholesomeness, Literal Cat, Sylvie when Cat Girl is gay and doesn't go to bed on time. Reblog if you too are gay and or don't go to bed on time. Lily Sap, Shadowfire 638. Moshi Moshi IRS Dono, Game of Champion is draining my bank account to keep me from reminding her to how pronounced Superutan Suri. It's been theorized that the baby Deinonychus lived in trees and may have even been able to glide through the air. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land when you can no more hold me by the hand. If you're seeing this, then I forgot to change my Patreon name again before the latest video. How embarrassing would that be? Doodle Sack 12, Jen Duro. Rob Jackson says there is no Easter Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and there is no Walt Disney Studios. Awkward silence. Many sentences within program were of a dangerous length and were performed by trained vocal practitioners. Don't try it at home. Jen the pink-haired cat on Twitter.com says meow. Trish Chandler, Eagle Weege, F. Amadon, Quiet Mistrevis, Darknet, Frequently a Doofus, Occasionally an Idiot, Always a Fool, Brisky, Ian Beck, Landfair Pool, Gneagle, Gogory, Shuin, Rindrob, Will, and Cecilio, Go, Go, Goach. Kierkev, Biohazard. Hey, is anyone missing an underscore? I found one under the rug. Rekindled with the power of RNG. Fluff System, Chris Kuslin, Charles Surrett. There is only one gender, it's mine, and you cannot have it. Sophia has transed her gender. Om Gong, my name is finally in a Game Champ video. Does this count as a ha ha funny meme name? Notice me, Senpai. Kirito9979. Cody Merchant, Seltzer Fountain Man. Madison, Aussie, 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 Oi, Oi, Oi. Touchstone Banana Phone, Melody Bunna. Twin B, the Tailmeister. Kaiser says sometimes a bit of solitude is needed to figure out where to go next in your life. Moomin Biscuit, trans rights are human rights. Everyone's favorite trans dragon girl and clan ghost bear mech warrior, Aurelia. STL of the Wild, Ken of Red Lions, a shape shifting mass of cinders and ashes. Duna Nix, Dynamaton, Gameplay 4. Well, at least my best friend isn't an uncuddleable. Getsugaru, Love Story Gaming, TTV, Mr. One Up Machine. Lex spent $10 so Miss Champ would say Betty Botta bought some butter. But said she, this butter's bitter if I put it in. Rock Band Soccer, Damageless Wind, Celica. Stan's Plaid Jacket, Eric Williams, DJ Oshawa, Ray Danger, Kelsini, Awesome Games. Flame Solace, Macaroni Cat, Robin with a Y. Harry Stovall, Autistic Yu Gi Oh! Kung Leonidas, I welcome Queen Elizabeth to Tute Shadow Rail. Haleran, Pokachap. Jink Shadow, maybe not accent. Random Internet Cat is a random cat on the internet and should not, under any circumstances, be trusted to do non cat things. Hyper Simulacra, Kimber Belize has remembered to pronounce the second B, and good luck with Shotless Splatoon 3, Miss Game Champ. Hello, this is Daybreak, the Auroran Goddess's reminder to stay hydrated. This is a threat. Also, day of birth, October 25th. Yippee! It's Caroline, not Carolyn. Jazzy36. Nicole the Gamer Girl and Gamer Girl. Transient Faye. Tourbit. Zach Crowder. Zeta is pretty invalid. Malabell. Zentilt. Jorel Bell. Jane the Jane. Joshua Bennett. Lonely Agent J. And Tash. Let me know how much this video sucks and how to improve in the comments below. But none, 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 none for watching and get out of my house. By the way, I forgot to feed the elephant. It's dead. It's canonically dead. That's it. The end.